An island surrounded by sentiment and bathed in tears of joy and sorrow. That is Ireland, a nation of dreamers and poets, a country of fighters and gentlefolk. As an ancient Irish ballad would have it, a little bit of heaven that dropped from the skies one day. Ireland is not a rich nation, but hard work and a devotion to the land have brought prosperity to the small farmers who for many centuries were oppressed by absentee landlords. The Irish are wanderers by nature, too. Thousands of tinkers roam the land, ready to mend a pot or trade a cow. They say their wants are few, the sky for a canopy, the broad land their domain to roam. Their home is where they pause, be it field or roadside. Peat bogs and Ireland are synonymous. The Irish are the largest producers of dried peat, and they depend on it extensively for fuel. When it is spaded out in uniform bricks, the peat, composed mostly of decayed vegetable matter, is dried in long rows, the only processing necessary. Ready for market, part of the six million tons the Irish produce annually. The land is as rugged as her people. Much of the country is too rocky for crops, but suitable for sheep and cattle. Beauty, however, is a year-round harvest. The city of Cork and its seaport across the harbor cove is rapidly regaining the eminence it once enjoyed. It has a history that goes back to the seventh century. Ireland, of course, means St. Patrick the man who symbolized the nation in both fact and legend. He was a missionary who founded many churches, and Cashel boasts a classic example built on the site of a pagan temple. This ancient Celtic cross shows Christ on one side, St. Patrick on the other, a priceless treasure. The tomb of St. Patrick? No one knows for sure, but the site is revered as a monument to the patron saint, a place of pilgrimage. Five miles northwest of Cork is the most famous castle in Ireland, Blarney Castle. It played an important part in early Irish history. 18-foot thick walls made it impregnable to siege, but today its fame rests on its famous stone. The Blarney Stone is below the battlements on the south wall. You must be dexterous and agile to kiss the Blarney Stone. Kiss it and you'll receive the gift of Blarney, eloquence not granted other men. Fabled in song and story, the lakes of Killarney, crystal jewels nestled in a bed of emerald green. Loch Lean, or Lower Lake, is 5,001 acres studded with islands. This is the island that inspires the Irish poet and Irish mystic. There is a burgeoning tourist business in Ireland and the lakes of Killarney are a major magnet. Pony carts bring the visitor to the Gap of Dunlow. Pony carts can traverse the Gap, but the safer and more leisurely way is on horseback. Gap of Dunlow, long and awe-inspiring, carved from the hills in the Ice Age. Sparkling waterfalls crown the hills like fairyland tiaras. Upper Killarney Lake, the inspiration for poets, the panorama for artists. The home of President Kennedy's great-grandparents remains much as it was more than a hundred years ago when they migrated from New Ross to East Boston. Like so many other Irish immigrants, it was the Great Famine that drove them to the New World. The jaunting cart is a vehicle as gay as the Irish, not fast, but as unique as the Shamrock. The dome of the Custom House, considered one of the world's architectural gems, dominates the Dublin skyline. This is the focus of Irish culture and thought, with O'Connell Street, named for a great patriot, its main thoroughfare. There's a statue to O'Connell, and with fine Irish paradox, 
a column to British hero Lord Nelson. O'Connell's memorial recalls his fight to free Catholics from English oppression. Ireland honors her poets, too, Thomas Moore for one. The pillared post office building on O'Connell Street is a shrine for Irishmen. Here was fought a bloody battle during the Easter Rebellion in 1916, when Irish patriots seized the key government building. Shoppers Paradise is Grafton Street. Irish tweeds and laces? This bustling street is the place to find them. This is urban, modern Ireland. Architectural masterpieces are the rows of Georgian homes, brick and marble monuments to the heyday of Dublin's cultural greatness. No public function in Ireland can begin without the flourish of trumpets or the skirl of bagpipes. A hurling match is no exception. Hurling is a peculiarly Irish game. Field hockey raised to a supreme level of legalized mayhem. It's no game for the timid. It leaves scars that are badges of honor. More genteel a sport, but still rugged, is this mounted version of pushball. Irish horses are superb, and the gentry make an appreciative audience whenever two or more horses meet in any sort of competition. The Irish breed racers and jumpers, saddle horses and workers, horse flesh known around the world. Ireland is Irishman. These, then, are the Irish. A young nation, blooded in pain and heroism, conscious of its stormy past, sensitive to its religion, busily shaping a sturdy and prosperous future on a world scene. It's a nation that daily toasts a life of laughter and fellowship, yet prompt to turn sorrow to joy with a song or a tune. The Irish have music in their hearts, the Keeley, for example, spontaneous groups that gather for informal jam sessions, as have their great-grandfathers before them. Let the shillelagh stand proudly as symbol of the indomitable Irish spirit, the spirit that has spread all over the world and infused itself into all nations. May the Emerald Isle be ever tugging at their hearts.